AZA Safe, Saving Animals from Extinction, will focus resources, both from our expertise within our own AZA community, as well as new resources to saving animals in the wild. We'll be forging comprehensive partnerships across the globe, and for the first time, we'll be able to engage not only our 180 million visitors in conservation, but also the greater global community. So part of being here in South Africa is for us to be able to recognize what our expertise is within the AZA community and to be able to offer that expertise and resources that we can find to help support the programs that are already established here. People that have been working on African penguins in Africa for so long have been doing such a fantastic job and that's the information we've needed to help pick the African penguin as one of our pilot species. Now that we're here in South Africa, we've had the great opportunity to see all the different types of colonies and all the different threats affecting the African penguins. I'm here in South Africa and I wanted to talk about the AZA Species Survival Plan, or SSP. The SSP for African penguins is a cooperative breeding plan for 48 institutions in North America and we look to breed the birds for genetic and demographic sustainability over the long term. Over the years, our SSP members have contributed uh, morphometric data to the researchers down here in South Africa. And the morphometrics that we have collected are beak length, flipper length, and weight uh, on our birds in our care, uh, because we know that they're in good condition, we know their ages, and by providing this control data or normal data to the researchers down here, they can use that as sort of a gauge to judge the health of the, and the condition of the animals that they're bringing into the Sankop facility down here. why we want to conserve the African penguin, a lot of the threats that are happening in the world right now are a direct result of the impact that we as humans have. So certainly from a, a purist um, conservation point of view um, and to ensure we don't lose the biodiversity, um, we have a duty of care to conserve the species. We, we can use the penguin as an indicator to what's happening out in the ocean. Um, it's very difficult to monitor uh, marine mammals, fish species, purely because of the difficulty of the, the marine environment and the cost associated with monitoring in the marine environment um, in comparison to that in the terrestrial environment is huge. Um, with penguins that are breeding on land, um, the, the ease of access for monitoring programs is that much more. And so we can use our monitoring programs to have a look at what's happening out at sea. And with the decline in the species, it's a, almost an early warning system that there's something wrong. We're at the boldest penguin colony in Table Mountain National Park, South Africa and we're one of uh, two land-based colonies. Uh, the colony uh, started up in about 1983 with the first birds breeding in uh, 1985. Uh, since then our numbers have, uh, as you can imagine, increased, not just through breeding but through uh, birds coming from other colonies uh, to this area. Now, we suspect that the penguins uh, established themselves here and have enjoyed staying here for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which is the granite boulders, um, after which the park is named, uh, which forms a protected bay where the birds can uh, have shelter and protection from the uh, elements, the ocean currents, you know, the heavy sea conditions. Because we're a land-based colony and we're surrounded by a residential area, it brings a whole different component to it. And that is uh, around people, number one, wanting to visit the birds, there's quite a challenge um, that we have to deal with around uh, making people aware and obviously making sure that people behave in a certain way, that they can enjoy the birds whilst the birds are still safeguarded. Now on islands, 
which have had penguins for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, you would have a guano buildup where the birds would normally nest after burrowing in the guano to create this burrow. So we've put these artificial nests down and they've worked to varying degrees. The areas where the nest boxes work well are in already sheltered or shaded areas. Now the benefit of the nest boxes is that you can bring birds to nest in an area where you want them to nest. Also, uh, because of the shape of the box, it gives you protection from predators. It's got a single entry point and it's got breathing holes, so the air, there is airflow that can get through. The early days in 1982, basically, the first penguins arrived. You'll see the, the location, which is right on this peninsula point. And of course, if we can understand why the penguins, African penguin has always been on island, colonies, terrestrial predation. So we've created this buffer zone of human inhabitants and roads and networks, dogs, people. So in the middle on this hump, you've got your residential component. Residential component, houses, uh, lawn mowers, um, construction, uh, dogs, cats, people coming on holiday, party all night, etc, etc. So with the ecological demise in the forecourt of your habitat your birds preferably be went and sought sought healthier biomes so they naturally migrated into the residential we have to somehow deal with the residential component the public component as well as the ecological component so the fence went out we moved all these prospecting birds we put in all these artificial nests and i'm saying we there was probably myself and yvonne and maybe one other that actually helped in doing this process Samson Dyer, the guy that, the first guy on this island was 1806, he arrived here. His job was to, to, to skin seals, kill them skin, take them for the skins and all the oil. Then later on they started scrapping guano. This was one of the last islands that was scrapped. And the last guano left this island in 1984. So gentlemen, welcome to Dyer Island. Most of the, the, the coastal islands in South Africa were scrapped. Because at that stage, um, guano was like white gold. That's why all the penguins are breeding on, on top of the surface. There's no burrow material for them. And then they also did air collection. For so one year, they took off 62,000 eggs of Diana. It was a delicacy. People paid a lot of money for eggs. They've just been um, stabilized. Um, and uh, now we've put them in boxes, so we're going to take them to the mainland. Um, and therefrom, they're going to go to Sandkop um, to start the process of rehabilitating, um, getting them big so they can come back to the island, hopefully in a few months' time. She can hear his heartbeat, eh? Our main focus at this stage is on the African penguin because their numbers over the last 30 years, especially on Dyer, dropped in total 95%. We, we had 22,000 pairs at the stage and we're sitting at 1,200 breeding pairs at this stage. And now what the problem is, because the population is so small, any interference from the outside, like predation, um, the population can't handle it. And that's why we intervened and that's why we also take off the, 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 the small chicks when the parents go into malt, uh, just to keep the, uh, the numbers up. Well, it was really in response to those early oil penguins when uh, Althea Westfall, who started Sankov, uh, got some penguins into her car and into her garden because there was nothing in place to look after the species. And then, as I say, 50 years later, um, here we are with two facilities um, looking after an endangered species. Um, and we've had about more than 90,000 seabirds come through our facilities over the years. 
So the world's largest animal rescue operation actually took place here in Cape Town in South Africa and it was in the year 2000 when the MV Treasure sank between Robben Island and Dassin Island which at the time were some of the two of the largest African penguin colonies. 20,000 African penguins were oiled and a further 20,000 clean African penguins were re uh, translocated. 40% of the global population of African penguins were at risk. So in the early 2000s, Sankop admitted between 300 and 500 penguins every single year as a result of chronic oil pollution. So no specific incident was recorded, but these birds would just be oiled as a result of chronic oil pollution, so either from illegal dumping or accidental discharge. In the past three to four years, we've seen a significant drop in that number. And at this point, it's quite hard to say if that's because of, um, you know, results from better enforcement um, or compliance or actually because of the, the decline in the African penguin population and just because there are fewer birds around, the percentage of birds that are getting oiled or that we're actually able to retrieve is just so much lower. You know, people come here um, from around the world, uh, from Japan, Bulgaria, UK, tons of them, the, the US, Germany, to volunteer their time and to work uh, at Sankop with an endangered species. Okay, we've um, just received an African penguin from Boulders Beach. Uh, which is uh, near Simon's Town, uh, and it is brought in by one of our penguin monitors, and they give us a, sometimes give us an idea of what what the problem was. And this one says it was a seal attack, and it's injured on both legs. Everything seems to be working fine. So now what we need to do is check if he can actually walk, because that's one of the, the issues we get. Um, all right, we can put him down and just see how he walks. It's quite possible that we've got a spinal issue. Um, sometimes the kidneys are swollen and press on the nerves of the leg and that can also cause them to not be able to stand. So if we don't see anything on our examination and he's, um, and he's not able to stand, our next step will be x-rays um, to get an idea if, you know, if there's any broken bones or any strange swellings um, and then we'll make a diagnosis from there. I will say sometimes I, I wonder if I make a difference, you know, um, because I've never thought in my conservation career of 27 years that um, I will see a species going to be extinct. You know. So it might be that before I retire that the species will be extinct. And, and for a conservationist, I will say it's heartbroken when you, you put your life into the conserving a species and you just see it, it's going down.